Good morning, everyone. You're really welcome to First Armagh on this, the 26th of July. In a rather sad corner of the church, this beautiful window is a memorial to those who died in the First World War. Many young men, not only from Armagh, but from all around the world, went off to the fields of Flanders and died at that awful time. It was a global calamity. And at that time, many people asked, where is God in the middle of a calamity? We find ourselves in 2020 in the middle of a different calamity. And so we are going to think today about where is God? And the minor prophet that we're going to look at, Joel, is a helpful guide as he thinks, where is God in the midst of an ancient calamity? Our call to worship comes from Psalm 5. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, your Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Let's sing together hymn 194. This earth belongs to God. Let us pray. Lord, this morning we praise you, for you turn to us. You do not stay aloof. You don't look down on us. Rather, you turn towards us, not so much in anger, not taking spiteful vengeance on us. Rather, you turn towards us in compassion. You're gracious. We are mere humans crafted out of the dust, 
and yet you treat us with immense dignity. Almighty God, the one who created the whole universe, you turn to us, you pay us attention, you listen to us, and you give us space to express our emotions, even our negative emotions. You love us, you forgive us, and you call us to be partners in building your kingdom. We worship you. We adore you, the God of grace who turns to us. We confess we can turn away from you. We can prefer our own ideas, our own values, our own destiny. But through this crisis, we find ourselves turning back to you, repenting. We have become so much more aware that we need your values to live for. We need your word to guide us. We need your love to forgive us. And we need your power to serve in your world. So come, Lord, into our homes this morning as we turn to you using the words of the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Each minor prophet is different. Haggai and Zechariah are prophets to the returning exiles in Jerusalem. Haggai is two chapters of reasonably straightforward oracles. Zechariah has 14 chapters of stunning, vivid pictures. Jonah, four chapters of memorable personal story. And Nahum, three chapters about divine judgment on empires. Well, Joel is different again. We're not sure <clears throat> when it was written, nor to whom. In chapter 3, verse 6, it mentions the Greek empire, possibly of Alexander the Great. That would mean it would be the last written book in the Old Testament. It tells the story of calamity, and it contains some of the most memorable descriptions in the Bible. Our first lesson is from Joel chapter 1. We read verses 1 to 12. And it is read to us by one of our elders, Harry McKennell, from beside an old apple tree. Let us hear the word of God. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pachuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth, hold for the husband of her youth. 
The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. And we know that God will bless the reading of his own precious word. Amen. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his word. <clears throat> this is a passage about destructive insects called locusts. We're going to look at some of the children's photographs of insects and bugs and wasps and all sorts of things. At the peak of the coronavirus pandemic here in April, there was another calamity occurring in East Africa, a plague of locusts. Did you know that locusts can move at 100 miles in a day? The locusts present an alarming threat to food security and livelihoods. A swarm of just more than a third of a square mile can eat the same amount of food in one day as 35,000 people. So they are hungry little monsters. And this was the worst invasion of locusts in Kenya for 70 years. Thanks to the widespread use of pesticides nowadays from airplanes, in the 21st century, humanity has some chance against locusts. But in ancient times, they were harbingers of total destruction. Joel chapter 1 is one of the most brilliant descriptions in ancient literature. What happens is historical. Write it down. Keep a diary. Nowadays, take photos. This calamity does not happen often, so record it for your descendants. What Joel tells us, I am told, is biologically accurate. The great locusts are bad, but the younger locusts have even greater appetites. Joel describes their terrifying fangs, their quantity. Nobody could count them. Their insatiable appetite, their trail of destruction. They gobble up grain in fields. They devour the barks of trees. They strip bare vines, fig, 
palm and apple trees. And they're not fussy. Everything in their path is destroyed by this invading army of giant grasshoppers. It's an environmental calamity causing natural destruction. It is an agricultural calamity affecting food supply for animals. It's an economic calamity causing poverty. It's a personal calamity causing starvation and death. It's a spiritual calamity causing inner turmoil and questioning. Chapter 2 describes another invasion. And Joel is employing the image of locust destruction to describe the invasion of an imperial army. It could be the Assyrians invading Israel, or the Babylonians invading Judah, or the Greeks invading the Middle East. Armies need fed. They are not only a military calamity, but they're also an economic, environmental, and personal calamity, causing injury, death, poverty, and humiliation, causing post-traumatic stress for generations to come. In 2020, we have watched as the coronavirus has spread like a swarm of insects. Think back. As we celebrated the beginning of the new year, 2020, we had not even heard of coronavirus. Though doctors were starting to report a new dangerous flu in the Chinese city of Wuhan. But aided by rapid air travel, the virus swiftly swarmed from China, South Korea to Italy. Soon it swarmed through our airports, overwhelming, overwhelming hospitals in Milan, Madrid, London, and Dublin. Most calamities in history are local. If you have the wherewithal, you can escape to a place of safety. But this one has been global. Nowhere is safe for long from coronavirus. In its wake, it has left grieving families, weakened bodies, disturbed minds, and ravished economies. Joel, this ancient prophet, points us to three responses to calamity, still relevant in 2020. And the first is this, to lament. Biblically, lament is consistently the first and proper reaction to calamity. God does not want us to immediately say resignedly, this is God's will. It may sound good, it may sound pious, but this is mere stoicism. It is not biblical Christianity. God does not want us to cheerfully put on a smile and say, Jesus loves you. Rather, God wants us to live in the real world, to lament what is sad, what is wrong, what is destructive. Notice in verse 11, there are three commands from chapter 1. Despair, wail, and grieve, a trinity of lament. In verse 13, the priests are summoned to another trinity, mourn, wail, and dress in sackcloth. In verse 5, Joel gives good advice to drunkards. Instead of imbibing more alcohol, wake up, weep, and wail. Alcohol or drugs can be a distraction, a quick fix to squash down sadness and anaesthetize the pain. But we ought not to try to distract ourselves. We all need to face our sadness, to lament when things go wrong, to let God know how we feel. And the Bible is full of lament, the Psalms particularly. Let me read to you from Psalm 88. From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. 
darkness is my closest friend. Last year I was involved in the publishing of this book, Considering Grace, Presbyterians and the Troubles. The author Gladys Ganiel, in her conclusion, wrote about the need to lament. And she quotes the former moderator, Dr. John Dunlop. All successful travel journeys of grief involve remembering, grieving, and hoping. The only way to avoid the possibility of grief is to avoid opportunities to love. It is not possible for individuals to draw a line under their loss and get on with it as if nothing has happened. It would be callous for a community to travel into the future and leave grieving people behind. Sarah MacDonald will now read a section of the poem East Cooker. T.S. Eliot writes this poem in 1940 during a calamity, the, the Blitz in London. From East Coker by T.S. Eliot. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope. For hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love. For love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness, the dancing. In order to arrive there, to arrive where you are, to get from where you are not, you must go by a way wherein there is no ecstasy. In order to arrive at what you do not know, you must go by a way, which is the way of ignorance. In order to possess what you do not possess, you must go by the way of dispossession. In order to arrive at what you are not, you must go through the way in which you are not. And what you do not know is the only thing you know. And what you own is what you do not own. And where you are is where you are not. T.S. Eliot is saying in this poem, we need to lament even before we love again. We must go through the darkness to reach the light. We must go through the ignorance to reach the knowledge. We must go through the stillness to reach the dance. So Joel's first response to calamity is to lament. His second response to calamity is to repent. If we look at chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, Joel uses the word return twice. In verse 14, he talks about God turning. Now, prophets are not fortune tellers. That's a complete misunderstanding of their vocation. No, they are preachers who talk about repentance or turning to God again. Joel reminds his listeners concerning the character of God, chapter 2, verse 13, He's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. So as we turn to God, God turns to us. Locusts devouring, armies invading, calamities occurring are opportunities to turn. In chapter 3, verse 14, Joel talks about a valley of decision. You can turn this way 
or you can turn that way. But now is the time to make the decision, for the day of the Lord is here. Joel does not blame his listeners for the calamity, but he does say the calamity is an opportunity to repent or turn around, to turn away from bad behavior towards God and good behavior. Allow God to use the calamity to bring good. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is asked about two calamities. One's an act of political oppression by Pilate, the local Roman governor. The other's a natural calamity, a tower collapsing on top of people. Jesus' emphasis is not to attribute blame. Rather, he emphasizes repentance or turning around. Luke 13. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Of those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Our experience of this plague of coronavirus, subsequent lockdown and now economic uncertainty, should call us not only to lament, but to repent. And we already see some evidence of that. As a society, turning from inane busyness to more important values, community, environmental protection, nurturing family relationships. Many have been turning to God, tuning into broadcasts, reading the Bible more regularly, and praying more diligently. The universal experience of sitting in a pandemic waiting room, wondering each day if we will have a cough or a high temperature that could signal an encounter with weakness, a ventilator, or even death, has caused many to desire to repent or turn around. At this stage of the pandemic, do not lose that desire to repent or turn around. So Joel teaches us, firstly, to lament, secondly, to repent, and thirdly and finally, he talks about encouragement. During lockdown, Ivor Stevenson has been working in his garden, and this weekend you can visit the garden, and that itself will be an encouragement. Ivor will now read from his garden, Joel chapter 2, verses 21 to 32. Be not afraid, O land, be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals. For the open pastures are becoming green, the trees are bearing their fruit, the fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I send among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterwards I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. 
I will show wonders in the heaven and on earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. What wonderful words. I love that phrase in chapter 2, verse 25, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The prophet stimulates the imagination of his hearers. They, like many from the world wars, have been post-traumatically stressed. Their minds have been filled with images of stripped barkless trees, empty vineyards and desolate fields, as well as starving children. But now Joel calls them to a better day. To imagine a day when people of all genders and all ages are dreaming again. Instead of devastation, the very same land will flourish. Chapter 3, verse 18. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. So this is encouragement. New wine to lift the spirit. Strong milk to strengthen the body. Fresh water to quench the thirst. Trees, flowers sprouting again, providing beauty and nourishment. In the day of Pentecost, as the Holy Spirit came upon the church, these words of Joel are quoted. And so the Holy Spirit can come to you wherever you are this morning and encourage you. In this summer season, feast your eyes on what is beautiful. Go out into the open air. Take in scenes of growth. Feast your taste buds with good food. And allow God to provide you with encouragement. In conclusion, through this calamity, don't be afraid to articulate lament. Give yourself time and space to repent. And hold before yourself those images of encouragement, for there will be a better day. Our prayers this morning are led by one of our elders, City Somerville. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that lockdown measures are gradually lifting in this country. As they do, we pray for the recovering of communities the rebuilding of businesses, the stability of employment, the restoration of our health and care services, and preparations for the reopening of our churches and schools. May we all go forward together in safety, caring for one another, and preserving all that has been worthwhile in the past weeks. Loving God, we pray for refugees who have fled violence and hunger and now live in crowded camps where they are very vulnerable to coronavirus because of overcrowding and little access to clean water, enough food or medical care. In these circumstances, hand washing is difficult and social distancing is impossible. We pray that you will bless the work of the aid agencies as they try to provide clean water, soap, food and medical aid. We pray especially for Rachel Fletcher, a nurse from Belfast, serving with Save the Children, who is heading up a new coronavirus isolation and treatment centre in the world's largest refugee camp in Bangladesh. We ask that you would bless her work and keep her safe. We pray for the countries of East Africa, 
in particular Kenya, Ethiopia and Somalia, where so much of the land has been devastated by locusts. Crops due to be harvested to feed families and animals have been devoured by the locusts, as have seeds which would have been used for future crops. We ask, Father, that all those affected by this disaster will receive the help they need to recover, both in the short term and in the long term. We pray for all who grieve the loss of loved ones, for all who are ill and for all with caring responsibilities. May they be aware of your love and support and may they know the peace which you alone can give. We ask your blessing on all who are on holiday and ask that they would be kept safe as they travel. We pray especially for our Minister Tony, that you would grant him rest and refreshment. Be with the whole family as they enjoy spending time together. We thank you for the Air Ambulance Service and the vital contribution they make in emergency situations. We thank you that Ivor Stevenson is opening his garden this week to raise funds for Air Ambulance. And we pray there will be a generous response. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Next week we'll be looking at another minor prophet, Amos. Children, can you send photos of gardens or fruit before next Friday and send to Tracy Boyd, 077-161-60800. I recorded my part of this service in July, but I am now on holidays. In the event of an emergency, Please phone the clerk of session in Kyle 37 or 0771 or the Reverend Alan Marsh, who is providing pastoral cover. 37 Ivor Stevenson's garden is open today from 2.30 to 7 p.m. And then from Monday to Friday from 10 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. Can you call Ivor before you go so that he's able to organize safety and social distancing? And Ivor's number is 077-3430-3330. It's planned that services will resume in the church here on the 16th of August, but we hope to live stream as well. Our final hymn is hymn 95. Now thank we all our God from a recording in 2018. The hymn was written by Martin Rinkart after a plague in 17th century Germany. Let us praise God.
And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.